In today's education sector, there are many different definitions trying to explain what curriculum actually is. After all, we are all in search of answers. If I was to ask myself for my own definition of curriculum, I would say that it is a program of study which is based on age and level appropriate programs, which is based around government goals and objectives, which aims to help society and industry with the end goal of achievement and development. Alves 2010 and Tummins 2009 page 8 both came up with their own definition of what they think curriculum is. Alves came up with the components of curriculum which follow closely to the teaching cycle. They are as follows. Rationale, aims and objectives, content, methods, assessment, resources and finally evaluation. Tummins stated that curriculum can refer to both single subject areas, broader areas of provision and even policy interventions. It, comparing the two I would say I follow Alves' definition more. In my practice I follow a scheme of work which follows the first component which is rationale. From the rationale I come up with the aims and objectives making sure they are delivering the learning outcomes from the rationale that need to be met. This also helps decide on what methods of teaching I will use and what assessment will take place, as well as the resources I need to use. At the end of the term, I evaluate my scheme of work. This focuses on whether the learners had achieved or not. In the institution where I work, this information will be found on the company's SARS, which looks at the previous year as a whole and is graded, graded with areas that need improvement will have smart targets set to them to aid for a better outcome the following year. Rationale. Within my sector we run a BTEC rationale. The BTEC website say that the BTEC qualifications is the specification, our QCF level 3 qualification, designed to provide highly specialist work related qualifications in a range of vocational sectors. They give learners the knowledge, understanding and skills they need to prepare for employment. The qualification accredit the achievement for courses and programmes of study for full-time or part-time learners in schools, colleges and other training provider organisations. The qualifications provide career development opportunities for those already in work and progression opportunities to higher education, degree and professional development programmes within the same related areas of study within universities and other institutions. This rationale follows an assessment curriculum. Learning this model is designed with the assessment checkpoint. This is through the BTEC guidelines. Assessments are tailored to individual needs and they choose how they want to complete the assessment. However, there is a timescale in place. Within a daily lesson, other models are incorporated. During initial planning stage, we follow a content curriculum model, which is a framework of what we are going to deliver, or in my case, my scheme of work. This is where we identify a range of units that are necessary for the learners to study, to become proficient in that subject area. I believe the curriculum I teach is currently not up to date, and there are certain units which will not enable learners to pursue a career within the game design industry. However, from my own hidden curriculum, students will be able to leave with enough knowledge about the current state of the game industry with regards to technology and being up to date with various skills and how to use technology. With their program and study as well, they will leave with lifelong learning skills, as well as knowledge of legal and ethical restrictions and codes of conduct. They will also understand equality and diversity, and also the importance of British values. Within my current sector, I currently teach with a determined curriculum. Musgrave, 1973, considered three different intentions or functions of curriculum. One of these was the determined curriculum. This is what we have now and is based upon past decisions and is reactive. The reason for this determined curriculum are that it's firstly something the teaching professionals are used to and familiar with. Another to do is with cost and how much money the qualification currently provides. The current BTEC rationale we use is a determined curriculum. However, we are always trying to review and strive for a better curriculum for our learners. Another one of these intentions and functions is adaptive curriculum. This is about how the curriculum ought to be. As technology and the games industry is always changing, we always need to be reflecting and adapting to new technology, being proactive to get learners ready for employment and how the industry is currently being run and also how the industry will change. As a sector, we strive for this.
Lastly, Musgrave stated that there is the determining curriculum. This involves designing curriculum to change the existing social system. Currently, FE provisions the government is changing the current social system by doing the following. External work experience, employability skills, prevent, British values, maths and English, equality diversity and online learning. Ideologies. Scrimshaw 1984 came up with five ideologies within curriculum. They are the following. Classical humanism, instrumentalism, liberal humanism, progressivism, reconstructivism. Firstly, I will start off with classical humanism. This has roots in ancient Greece through the teaching of Plato, 428 to 380, 348 BC. This is a study that everyone has and knew their place within society. In today's society, and especially in the United Kingdom, we still live in a society that has social grades and social economic status. The social grade in our country is categorised, with A being some of the highest paid work, to E being either the elderly or unemployed people. This follows very similar patterns to what was happening thousands of years ago, that everyone has a place and will be categorised for being that. When it comes to socio-economic status, the BBC 2013 created a test that sorted us into distinct groups. They were as follows. Elite, the wealthiest and most privileged. Established middle class, they work in traditional professions and take part in a wide variety of cultural activities. Technical middle class, this is a prosperous group preferring emerging culture, social media and mix mainly among themselves. They work with technology and come from middle class backgrounds. Now I myself am an emerging culture, I use social media and mix mainly technology with people that are like minded like myself. However I don't come from a middle class background. Then there's new affluent workers. These people are economically secure without being well off. Again I identify as this class. Traditional working class. Oldest average age like to learn their own home. Jobs include lorry drivers, cleaners and electricians. Emergent service workers. Young people, high social and cultural capital. Precariat. The poorest and most deprived social group. The problem with socioeconomic status and social code is that it follows a classic humanism approach. We are labelling people. Sure, people might be poor, but that doesn't mean to say that they won't achieve. This type of approach can lead to universities such as Oxford or Cambridge rejecting applications because you come from a working class background. And for a country that supports freedom and British values, this approach can no longer work. In terms of my curriculum, this is not an ideology I teach, because in game design, everyone has the freedom to become what they want to be, and whatever background they come from. There are no exams to judge you on your skill, and is a very practical curriculum. The next ideology is instrumentalism, which is a curriculum which is geared to a specific product, or other words, job. Callahan, 1976, in the Great Debate, saw government influence in education, which prepared young people for adult life and for employment. Within my rationale, you could say that this ideology, ideology is more appropriate. Learners sign up to do a game design course, and the units they undertake are to do with game design. They develop skills and professionalism directed towards the game industry sector, which include laws and ethics, and being able to develop and update their knowledge in a forever changing sector. However, there is a slight problem with this approach. If instrumentalism is a curriculum geared towards a specific product, isn't that forcing us back to classical humanism? Can't someone who has done game design course go on to be an artist? The best way to embed instrumentalism is to give, to give the learners the skills they need to prepare for adult life and for employment. The ideology I embed within all my lessons is liberal humanism. This focuses very much on the inclusion and developing a fairer society, far away from where we were with classical humanism. Within my curriculum, learners should be given the best teaching vision, and we should be focused on being learner first. This means that they are given the best possible teaching and learning experience, focusing on each learner's strengths and developing that at the learner's pace, as well as their weaknesses. This is the one that I strive to embed, and is one of my things within my hidden curriculum. 
However, there are some problems with this. While we all we would all like to live in a fair society, society itself and its socio-economic and social grading system says we can't. This can have a massive effect on curriculum being learner first. This depends on the provisions available and the amount of learners you have in total. More learners equals more money. More money equals more resources that you can use to help have an inclusive environment. However, if you don't have the numbers, money is not going to come in. Therefore, restricting your access to resources to help being learner first and meeting everyone's needs and requirements. Also, more numbers also leads to more planning to be inclusive. Time is then taken away from marking, IVing and planning. So while we'd all like to be liberal humanisms, it's very difficult to embed that and be an inclusive environment to all our learners. However, we should all be adapting this approach and going away from classical humanism where everyone had their place. Progressivism is about ne meeting the needs and aspirations to meet personal growth and strengthen democratic society. It is based on being active with problem solving, which can interest and challenge learners. Within progressivism, learners take more responsibility with their learning. However, sometimes you get learners who are on your course for different reasons. This creates a barrier to their learning, but creates an approach where they are not interested in being responsible for their own learning. Progressivism is about embedding functional skills like English and maths, employability skills, confidence and teamwork. This is about to improve skills for later life and also giving them a foundation. This can also include the hidden curriculum. Rousseau, 1712 to 1778, stated that the importance of each individual developing their own ideas and that every child has a desire to learn and that people develop through different stages. While I agree with all them facts, the problem is not with progressivism, the problem lies with our education system itself. If we go back to one of those points which is say uh, people develop through different stages, then why at school do we punish learners for not being interested within a subject? Why do we stop them being creative? I believe my curriculum follows progressivism because game design is all about developing and learners developing their own ideas. However, because of times um, assignment work, we're punishing learners who take time on a project to fully adapt their idea. Finally, we come to reconstructionism, which is about education to change society. As we're controlled by the government and the Ofsted influence, and as, a, as an organisation we have to stick to guidelines and any new guidelines they choose to implement. Such guidelines are the importance of English and maths, and that all learners who don't achieve C at school will have to take it again in further education. While this is good for their CV in the long run, it doesn't tie in well with a liberal humanism and giving the learners choice. The reason why this happens is because the government looks at education across the world and where we fit in. If we're behind of other developing countries, then change will happen, the end goal being to help our society. Within my sector, we are currently developing a technological and digital society which is paperless and that focuses on innovation and creativity. Influences of curriculum Influences in curriculum plays a huge part on how curriculum is changed and altered. This can either be from a teaching standpoint and how they adapt their scheme of work, or from a garment standpoint. The influences can also come from the learners themselves. To help discover what influences my curriculum has, I have created a steeple analysis. Steeple stands for the following. Social. Technolo technology. Economic. Environmental. Political. Legal. Ethical. Sustainability. Firstly, I'll start with social. In my area, this includes learner backgrounds, embedded in quality and diversity and inclusion, as well as social media like Twitter. Next is technology in my area. This needs to be up to date to facilitate advances in software and hardware. This is meant to reflect industry and the grown games industry market. Current provisions, however, are poor due to poor learner numbers the past few years and not making it an industry relevant course. Next is economy. This is heightened by the impacts of the recession. 
but also the lack of LMI in the current area, with many game design companies going bankrupt. This has increased the need for self-employment and also experience within the workforce, making the area more competitive. Environmental. In my area, the current classroom facility is poor and does not reflect what it would look like to work within the game industry. Rooms are dull and uninteresting. Also, the area contains only a small percentage of game design companies within the area. This means learners can't experience what it is like within the industry and also have the chance for work experience. Next is political. Current political agendas focus on the importance of English and maths with learners having to do four hours of GCSE per week if they don't have a C or above. This is to increase their chances of employability, but it's also the institution's source of income. This can lead to learners having poor attendance as they don't like being forced to attend. Legal. In my area, we promote the Data Protection Act, Safeguarding, Every Child Matters, Game Design Codes of Conduct, Copyright, Intellectual Property Rights, and professional bodies such as PEGI, which stands for Pan-European Game Information, and also ESRB, which is Entertainment Software Rating Board. We also embed ethical in our curriculum, with this being British values, equality and diversity, game design ethics, risk assessments, emerging social concerns like what's happening in America and their politics, policies and procedures. And also sustainability. How we upscaling our curriculum. We're currently going through electronic assignment submission documents and resource sharing, marking, whether this be Moodle, Google Docs, OneDrive, Turnitin, Markbook, utilizing the tutor's strengths in different areas and also being a paperless organization. Why does curriculum change? A curriculum changes because it should. It should always continually be developing for the needs of everyone involved. However, influences and factors do play a part in why a curriculum can change. These factors affect a curriculum's development, which includes industry ch changes, government changes, funding, attitudes, resources, legislation and sustainability. These are all stakeholders within our curriculum. There are two types of factors, external and internal. External factors social expectation and changes expectation of employers community assumptions and values nature of subject disciplines nature of support systems expected flow of resources then there's the internal factors students teachers institutions existing resources and problems within our existing curriculum this was adapted by Reynold J and Skillback at 1976. Ofsted. For many teaching professionals, the thought of Ofsted visiting is a daunting experience. However, they work with one of our stakeholders in curriculum, which is the government. Ofsted are always coming up with new ways on how we should teach and what is better for the learner. A major factor on why our curriculum changes. Should we be scared of them? They come in and they essentially judge an institution there and then in the space of a week, grading them on their performance, taking into account such things as attendance, retention, impact, English and maths, British values, quality and diversity, prevent, online learning, work experience. Being judged on all them things is scary. However, we need to bear in mind that these officials are teachers themselves, and the main cause should be to improve teaching across all sectors. Being scared should not be a factor either. According to Ofsted's new strategic plan for 2016, there are three new overarching priorities. They are Number 1. Improve quality, efficiency and effectiveness. Number 2. Improve focus. And number 3. Improved engagement. The teachers and institutions will be judged upon how we follow the common inspection framework. This is what Ofsted inspection is based on and we should always be fully aware of what they look for within a curriculum. They are as follows. Are the provisions and the related services meeting the full range of the learner's needs? How and why? 
What steps need to be taken to improve provisions further? How well do the learners achieve? How effective are teaching, training and learning? How well do programs and activities meet the needs and interests of the learners? How well are the learners guided and supported? How effective are leadership and management in raising achievement and supporting all learners? Within my department, innovation and creativity is something that we strive towards. This is coupled with the fact that within the institution I work, innovation is now at the forefront of what the institution wants to accomplish. My experience with this, however, have been pretty bleak and I have encountered barriers for this to work effectively. One such barrier was the fact that I teach across different sectors, all with different values and goals. It has been difficult to be innovative and creative when I'm trying to be inclusive to all 200 plus learners that I used to teach. Also coupled with the fact I was working with different values and visions. Currently this barrier is slowly shifting and I'm able to embed innovation and creativity within the lessons. Another barrier is the actual room layout and resources I have available currently. The main room in which I teach does not reflect an innovative department and is not industry reflective either. The room is uninspiring and the computers are not industry standard. However, my communities of practice are always willing to listen to my ideas and support me however they can. This has led to new rooms being put into place and also new equipment so I can do my job effectively and also embed innovation and creativity. Upon reflection and evaluation, I would say the reason for these factors have been that the course I have run has not had enough numbers in recent years or good results. This has led to department changes to try and improve the course. Since I've been employed, numbers have gone up as well as attendance and retention. Destin destinations and achievements are also positive. Having 40 plus learners this year is also a reason why new rooms are being commissioned as well as the institute's goals to be an aspiring institution and also to share industry practice. My expertise plays a big part within my curriculum. I am currently a program leader for my course but to discuss my expertise I have created a SWOT analysis. My strengths. I have up to date industry knowledge and experience. I keep in the loop with everything to do with game design. I know what units to teach and what will be beneficial to help the learners get into the current market. I also have game design experience by making my own games, but also running my own company called Paying the Rent. I also have a game design relevant degree. My weaknesses. I have limited program leader experience mixed with limited industry experience. Although I run my own small company, I have limited experience working for a big company. Having this experience will give me more knowledge on the current state of the market and how the curriculum should be. Opportunities. There are also opportunities in regards to training and adding to my CPD. This can be used for my program leader role, but also various bits of game design to prove my skills. An example of this would be the fact that my weakest area of game design is 3D modeling. But with opportunities I have to practice, I am able to bring these more into lessons and also increase my own CPD. Threats. Game design is an ever-changing industry and I could become out of date. For example, someone can come in that has a high experience that I do. Or I could miss out on the latest technology or latest software that I haven't had chance because I teach to be able to experience and embed within my lessons. Evaluation. Curriculum evaluation is about the following. Why, where, who, what, how. The first question we need to ask ourselves is why do we evaluate? The answer to this is because we need to evaluate the curriculum to discover the positives and negatives. This will enable us to move forward with good practice and methods for improvement. This leads us to where we should evaluate. Should this be done at the beginning? or should this be done at the end? In truth, we should be constantly evaluating through the curriculum cycle because cycle consists of diagnostics of needs and analysis, aims and objectives, content, structure, teaching and learning strategies, assessment and evaluation. It is referred to as a cycle because one stage is complete and a new curriculum year begins. The cycle starts again. This leads us to who. 
Who should evaluate and who should we consider when evaluating? Everyone who's part of your curriculum should be evaluating. To come up with better strategies for teaching the following year, this should be noted in the institution's SARS. When we evaluate, we should consider all stakeholders within our profession. These range from parents to learners, local employers and the government. The point of this is trying to get the best possible curriculum we can. What we should evaluate. This is a long list, but I'll give you a few. We should evaluate strengths, weaknesses, distance travelled, materials, resources, feedback, retention, attendance, OTLs, schemes of work, assignment briefs, lesson plans, behaviours, communities of practice. The last question is how we evaluate. There are many tools that can assist when evaluating, evaluating curriculum. These can include learner results and the value added reports, Ofsted inspection reports, past and present, internal verifications and external verifications and feedback. Feedback can come in many forms from observation feedback to feedback received from parents and learners. Feedback can also be accessing where learners have progress after your course is finished, whether this is into employment or into higher education course. A good evaluation tool with evaluating curriculum is Kirkpatrick's model, 1975. The model is done in four levels. Level 1. Reaction of learners. Student engagement, enrollment, retention, achievement, success, employment. Level 2, their actual learning, skills matrix, appropriate skills mix within the staff, Bloom's taxonomy, theoretical content needs to be understood to carry out practical process, appropriate levelness when teaching. Level 3 is behaviour, work placement, employee feedback, student feedback, general evaluation and reputation. And level 4 is results, value added. Statistics against the national averages, meeting government targets, mass, English, embedding, equality and diversity. This is an effective tool for evaluation as there are a clear sequence to follow, which can be adapted to specific curriculum areas. It should be noted, however, that there have been criticism against Kirkpatrick's model, which argues that the evaluation is incomplete. Canon Boas, Salas and Tenenbaum, 1995, suggested that this model presents an oversimplified view of training effectiveness that does not consider the characteristics of the organisation and the work environment and the individual as a crucial input factor. During my time as a teacher, I observed and made my own judgments and evaluation about my own curriculum. This process has led me to discover many things that work well within my curriculum, the main one being how we embed technology within to our lesson, and how to make lessons more innovative, demonstrating good practice to other communities. The inclusion of cloud saving options like Google Docs and OneDrive have also been a positive step. I found this practice positive because it enables learners to have ease of access to live documents that can be changed and saved instantly, but the student is also able to see the changes live. This process demonstrates our ability to reflect industry standards in which we try to be a paperless curriculum. However, it is not all good news within my curriculum. If I was going to change one thing in my curriculum, it would be to do with the rationale. Currently, we are working on the, the BTEC Creative Media Pathway, which includes game design units. However, under all these units, there is not a unit solely on programming. This is a major flaw within my curriculum, because without programming, you have no game, thus not reflecting what is happening within the industry. This means learners that finish within my course are not leaving with a complete skill set to help them in higher education or in employment. Programming, however, is something that I put within my hidden curriculum. The hidden curriculum is something I have mentioned in my vlog earlier, but here I'll explain what it is. As according to Avis 2010, the hidden curriculum refers to the consequences of factors outside of formal teaching which shape the educational experience. In other words, the hidden, hidden curriculum focuses on curriculum which comes from the teacher's values and beliefs as well as the organisations. It is not something we have to do within our curriculum, however, it is something that all teaching professionals embed. Some of my hidden curriculum includes programming. No swearing, being polite, keeping things tidy, feet off chairs and desks, no sitting in the corridor, time management, business management, 
creative freedom, confidence, self-esteem, communication skills, punctuality. All of all this, I believe, well, gives the learners the correct skills they need for life, on which only come from the hidden curriculum. Guru 2003 suggested the tools, it is important and it is important to discuss the politics no child left behind, that the, hi game ha that the hidden curriculum is no longer hidden. Um, due to and then neoliberal ideology. Manage your assets as well. Although there is some evidence to back up so through, I, some of the believe, years I do believe there are certain elements of curriculum that, that might remain hidden. In there that this is because every teacher or professional, or professional has their own values and beliefs. As long as their values and beliefs can benefit in some way, there will always be hidden and agendas. Unity levels later on in the year. To improve my okay. year's curriculum, so I am constantly looking for better alternatives. And for next academic year, so we will all, be moving on to the new BTEC spec, which doesn't um, which does include a programming unit. Make sure that it's a 2D, I'm also looking so a at other qualifications. Um, However, for us to swap qualifications, it would depend on the cost of registering each learner and also tests. what they offer in return. Um, what in the future, I hope mean is that my curriculum will embed everything to do with game design, um, pre -pre give the learners plenty of ammunition going on to higher education or straight to employment. Um,